So, it's our first staff here, and I just kind of want to know a little bit about us. Uh, thank you, Zach, for your introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to share a little story about me. I was um, raised in the islands for part of my life. My parents were missionaries on an island called Madras, or the Marshall Islands. If you could just go ahead, we'll start the slides. And can we have these lights out up here? This is something there. And you, you can't see it too clearly, but the house in the gray there was my house, where we lived in the Marshall Islands. And uh, the window down there, below the white rim around it was our kitchen window. And uh, that's where we almost got robbed through. Somebody tried to break in, and my dad would hit him over the head with a wiffle ball bat. And uh, that took care of it. <laughs> And uh, one of those coconut trees, I, I watched a coconut fall and land right where the little four-year-old had been standing seconds before. Um, so a lot of memories in that place. And uh, one of the things, one of the memories that's not so good is that I was often homesick. In fact, in those upstairs windows on the other side, I would sit and look out to my home school and look out over a school. And this was the place where all the um, expats went to school. So there were a lot of uh, young kids who looked like me, who had my skin color. Uh, and then there was another school, just a little ways. I could also see that school as well. That was the Adventist school. And that's where all the local uh, kids went to school. And. I was home, and I missed being back home in the United States. Don't you want to go home? Don't you miss home? I want to talk to you today about heaven. And if we can go ahead and just go to the next slide. The question I want to ask is this, what will heaven be like? What is heaven going to be like? Uh, now, I have to admit to you that I wrote this sermon for kids, okay, so, um, sorry adults, but the thing I, I've learned though is that, in fact, a preacher that I admire greatly once said that if you can reach about fourth grade level, everybody else will enjoy it too, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to do that, kids, so I apologize if, if I sometimes dip up, okay, you know, I, I should try to stay at the fourth grade level as much as possible. So what's that going to be like? Well, we're going to look at the scriptures a little bit. I'll grab my Bible. I have some uh, scriptures on the screen as well. Let's go ahead and check the slide. Well, first of all, we have to realize that the Bible said that I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God prepared for them that love him. So we recognize that not everything in heaven we're going to understand now. Okay, that's just the bottom line. However, the Bible has given us enough of an outline that we can have an idea of what heaven's going to be like. I'd like to share some of that with you today. Let's go ahead and change the slide. I want to take you on a journey that starts after a time of terrible darkness on this earth. It's a time when people who have been transformed into demons, really, in, their, in how they behave, will try to exterminate God's people. It will come to the point where they will literally, the, the, the day now will come and they're going to try to destroy us, and God will intervene. And we'll see some amazing things during those times, and, and uh, I'm not going to go through all that now because that's another sermon. Uh, but at the end of all that, we'll be looking up and seeing this sight. Well, that's a poor representation of what we're going to see, but it's a representation. Can you see it okay? Is there a way we can turn off more lights? Is that possible? We might see a little bit of a can. Turn off the chandelier lights, we might be able to. So let's read 1 Thessalonians. Can you turn the, the slide for me? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven from a shout. With the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead Christ will rise first. So we're standing there, we see the Lord 
descending from heaven, and there's a shout, and uh, the voice of an archangel, which, by the way, is Jesus. The archangel means king of angels. And with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. So we're going to get to see our loved ones rise up from the grave. And then they're, they're going to start going up, and we're going to say, hey, hold on. Next, next slide. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught together with them. And we can go back. <laughs> in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And yeah, that's good if we're going to always be with the Lord after that. But we're going to say, hey, hold on, wait for me. And start heading up into the clouds to meet our dear Savior. And then, we go ahead, as we're flying, we're going to look back and we'll see planet Earth on fire. And 1 Peter 3.10 says this life. The heavens will disappear with a war with the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth, everything done in it, will be laid bare. And we're not going to take too long of a later look at it, so I think we're going to be glad to let it burn. Let it burn. <laughs> done with that, we can start over. Let's do the press the reset button. Let's go on and we're going to experience our new home. Next slide. Now it's interesting, uh, if, you, if you read the little book, Early Writings, uh, she says something in there that's, that's fascinating. And I think it alludes to the fact that we, as we're flying, will head straight up and into the Orion Nebula. Let's read that. Go ahead and change the slide. The atmosphere parted and rolled back, and then we looked up through the open space in Orion, whence came the voice of God. She's describing here, back on Earth, when God delivers his people. This is before Jesus comes. And the people are trying to, to kill us. And um, the clouds part back. And she sees this, this, the atmosphere open. She sees the Orion Nebula. She hears the voice of God come out of it. And then she says something interesting. The holy city will come down to that open space. Okay, let's do some reasoning here. If the holy city is coming down to that open space, I'm guessing there's some sort of portal there. It's kind of one of the science fiction things, you know, where you go through and pop, pop through space and you kind of somewhere else in the universe. I'm, I'm guessing we can not understand physics or the truth about that. But we'll, we're, we're hoping, or we're, we're assuming anyway. And if that's the case, then that may be the place where Jesus will come through when he gets us, and where we'll go back up through. So we're going to assume that today, okay? So, next slide. We're flying up into the Orion Nebula and off towards planet heaven. Next slide. I do believe heaven is a planet, by the way. Uh, you know, God has a way of designing things. And he has a pattern when he designs things. You know, in fact, the pattern is so prevalent, scientists have noticed that. This is where we get these weird theories like evolution. Scientists look at a monkey and they see a similarity between us and the monkey, and they say, oh, well, we must be related. Uh, recently, we were at the uh, North Carolina Zoo, and it was the cutest thing. This little little girl was at the window looking in at these baby gorillas, and the similarities were amazing. They were playing peekaboo and tag, you know, or not tag, can't play tag, it's pretty last. Peekaboo. And it was just, you know, a cool sight. But people look at these similarities and say, oh, they must be related. Well, it's because God is a designer. They are related, but just not the way they think they are. We have the same father, right? The same one made us all. And you can look at a frog, you can look at a lot of animals, and we all have a similar design. And I think God does the same thing with heaven. In fact, my guess is, is that heaven is sort of the pattern for the rest of them. And our earth is, is just like we were made in the image of God, our earth is made in the image of heaven. So we're flying in towards planet heaven, and we're all excited because we can see it. And there it is! Let's go! All right! Finally, after all this time! And next slide. We're headed down. We start seeing something peering over the horizon. Something shiny and gold. As we're looking, we realize that huge thing is the city of God. Next slide. Now, the Bible actually describes the size of the city. And in Revelation, it gives us the dimensions, the actual dimensions of, of the city. And the, the problem is, it's hard to know exactly how it's worded, with, with the way it's worded, what it means. It, it says that it's a certain length, okay, which equals in our 
mileage of about 1,500 miles. It says the wall is 1,500 miles long, and it says it's the same wide, tall, high, everything. So we're not sure if it means that you divide the 1,500 into four, or if you just keep it 1,500. So we'll assume, though, that if you divide it into four, that means that the walls of the city, if you were to, if you were to put the corner of the city in Asheboro, which is where I made the point because I just preached in Asheboro. <laughs> if you were to put it in Asheboro, that's where the city would, would, would lie. It's a pretty big city. If you were to fly over the top of that city, which you'll be able to in heaven, you would fly into outer space if you were on planet Earth by about 20 miles or so. Okay, that, that's pretty cool. You, you take, a, take a walk, let's take a walk up the top of the building up into outer space. It's pretty neat. I can handle that. Of course, we just came from outer space, so it's not going to be that big of a deal, but still. Now, if you take the 1,500 miles, let's, let's change the slide again. That's the size the city would be. It would cover most of the United States. And now it's thousands of miles taller than our atmosphere. And since, since God is the creator, I can trust that he understands physics a lot better than I do, because I'm not sure how the world of a Spear could spin with that thing sitting on it. Maybe it's not getting all, probably has a counter made on it or something. Who knows? Maybe he doesn't need it. He's got it. Typically, he tends to work, though, through his own natural laws, so I, I assume he has some way to make it work. And I look forward to seeing how he's going to do that. All right, next slide. So we're, we're flying down, and we're heading down towards this beautiful city, and we start seeing around the city this shimmering, shiny blue thing. The city is resting on it. The Bible says, before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. Okay, now here's where the disappointing part is for some people. When I was a kid, I always wanted to walk on the sea of glass, right? The, because I could walk on water. The problem is that's not what the text is talking about. Oh, don't be disappointed. It's, it's, the truth is always better than, than fiction, right? <laughs> right? Always. No, it's a sea of glass, okay? It's actually, it's like a bunch of big, huge, giant sea made out of glass. So it's not glass, it's a lot better than that. But it's, it's like glass, we'll assume. We're actually, we can actually find out, I believe, what the color of the sea is, because there's a similar thing described in Exodus. And, or, you're wrong, let's go to the next uh, slide, please. Exodus, thank you. And they saw the God of Israel, there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. Now this is when Moses and his friends went up to see God. They actually saw God. I, mean, I just casually read it. Yeah, they saw the God of Israel. That's huge. Not very many people have had this opportunity. But when they're looking at God, and he's sitting under, on his throne, they see this paved work underneath his throne. That's the color of sapphire. I have a the slide there. It's, it's just a bunch of bunch of sapphires all piled in together there. That's, the, that's basically the color of this crystal sea will look like, this sea of glass. And that to me is just cool. I just love color. My wife especially loves color even more than I do. My, my wife dreams in color. Uh, she's, she loves to design things and to, to draw and paint. And uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to watching her expressions as she's experiencing all these colors to work out. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Now, Revelation 21, it tells us that the walls of the city, and as we're flying down, we're going to see these, these great walls. These walls are a different color than the rest of the city, and a different color than the sea of glass. It says that they look like jasper. Now, I'm very proud of this picture. I took it myself. And uh, this is our very own, part of our very own collection of jasper from our household. Our, our family went and visited a place called uh, Agate Beach in California. And Agate Beach is just an incredible place where you can find these beautiful agates in the sand. And you can also find jade and jasper. And we found a little bit of both of those, jade and jasper. Now, there's only one problem. Here's another myth. Man, this is not the same thing as the jasper that, that John was thinking about in the Bible. I was so excited because here I had this jasper, and I could, I could show people this is the color of the walls of the Jerusalem. And then I went to research and found that, that nope, not the case. But I guess it's always better, right? Yes, 
Back in those days, what, the way they described Jasper, um, and it actually looked like something else. By the way, the Bible describes this Jasper as being see-through. Okay? One of the characteristics of Jasper is that it is not translucent. That's how we know it's not Jasper. Okay? So that can't be what's Brown City. Okay? So let's take a look at what, really, what it really probably is. Go to the next slide. This is opal. They believe that what they call Jasper was opal. This is actually fire opal. I think it's going to be opal. It's going to be fire opal. It's going to shine. Isn't that neat stuff? I love it. it just to me, it's, it's, and I can imagine the glory of God shining through that. How that's going to glisten and glow. It's going to be incredible. Next slide, please. Now, the walls of the city are a work. There's something else. You can't see it very well. Let's see. Okay, let's just see. Okay, you can. Okay. Before I explain these balls, I just have to show you this. You see the two little dots there at the, the bottom of that hole? Those two little dots? Those are human heads. People standing behind the wall looking out. That's a big wall, by the way. Okay, this is one of the biggest, most amazing structures from the Middle East. But this wall is a great description of how the wall of the New Jerusalem was built. In John's day, in Bible times, they built a city wall with several layers of foundation stones before they ever built the wall to keep this nice and strong. And you can see these layers. They have a layer down here, and then another layer, and another layer, and then a layer of massive stones. You can see the size of those people. You can see those stones. And by the way, I think that this may have been built by giants. Some of those giants in the Bible times, because these, these rocks are so amazing. You science is still I've never figured out how they've been able to move, just like a lot of these pyramids and other things. But, so, and then above those, those rocks are even bigger giant rocks, and then they start building a wall on top of that. This, these are the foundation layers. So imagine that. But now we have the colors that John describes. Let's go to the next slide. Because he describes each layer of this wall. And each one is a different gem. Those are the gems that are used. Isn't that amazing? It's going to be so colorful. You're going to have that, those, those layered colors, different gems. And then it's going to go on. Next slide, please. And we told that the gates of the city are made out of pearls. Now, I always wonder, how in the world is a gate going to be made out of a pearl? It's so round. And, and it's like a ball. How do you open up a round ball, you know? Well, I put these pearls up here just to show you that pearls can get shape. Okay, so I don't know, maybe they have gate shaped uh, pearl oyster making. Oysters that make gate shaped uh, pearls, okay? Uh, and have a good nose and giant ones of that. So, next slide. And this is a really bad picture of the Jerusalem. <laughs> but I put it up there because of all the pictures that I found on the internet, this one has all the elements that the Bible describes, as far as I can tell. Except for perhaps the, the height, the dimensions of the city. But it has the multicolored layers of foundation, the different gems. It has the, the translucent white walls, the pearl gates. And this one, they've actually been carved out and there's gaps in the it's, it's beautiful, like lace or something. And then the gold, the city, and the rainbow, and also even the, the blue, uh, Christmas City below the Lord of God. All right, next slide. So we fly down, and it's just amazing. You see all these, these people, and they're, they're chained, they're glorified, and they're coming down and landing on the sea of glass. And you can see Jesus land, and we all kind of form this hollow square around him. And then you see the, the most amazing sight is Jesus starts handing out the crowns, the crown of life. To each person. And uh, we're told that the angels come, they bring out the crowns. I can imagine that the angels have designed these crowns, and perhaps it's what the angels do after you die, they kind of go, oh, this is my theory. Totally not out of the Bible, just an idea. The angel goes and takes some time off. God says, okay, that's, you worked really hard for that one, and, and if it's with me, then my poor angel's going to need like about a century to recover. And what I need you to do now is just make them a crown. Okay, spend some time relaxing, thinking about how you want their crown to look. That's my theory. Who knows? So, 
Anyway, the angels come out with their crowds, and Jesus begins to hand out each crowd. Now, can you imagine the numbers of people there? Time must like be nothing in heaven because it would take a long time for him to pass all those crowds. Who cares? We've got all the time in the world, right? He passes out the crowds. And then you know what we do with those crowds? We take them and we throw them at his feet. And all the angels are going, no! How are they going to find them? <laughs> We're a lot smarter than we are now. We'll find no problem. And then we see this scene that to me is one of the most touching scenes that's described of our first days in heaven. Let's go to the next slide. And I'm going to read it to you because it's it's worded so perfectly I could, I could never do it right, so I'm just going to read it to you. It's out of the great controversy. As the ransomed ones are welcomed to the city of God, they raise out upon the air an exultant cry of adoration. Next slide. The two Adams are about to meet. Of course, Jesus is the second Adam. Adam is the first Jesus. I imagine that they look a lot of alike. Jesus, if Adam is made in his image. The Son of God is standing with outstretched arms to receive the Father of our race. Next slide. The being whom he created, who sinned against his finger, and for whose sin the marks of the crucifixion are born upon the Savior's form. Next slide. As Adam serves the prince of the cruel nails, he does not fall upon the bosom of his Lord. No, no, no. He's not worthy of that in his mind. Next slide. But in humiliation, he casts himself at his feet, crying, Worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. I just can't wait to see that scene. Next slide. Tenderly, the Savior lifts him up and bids him look once more upon the Eden home from which he has so long been exiled. She goes on to describe, as he looks at the Eden up there in heaven, he realizes these are the very same trees that I once took care of. Very same plants. Then we all join in and say, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. So next slide. And then there's a scene that she describes that's quite interesting. We have to back up though in order to describe it. She says that at the resurrection there will be infants, children, that will come out of the graves. And the first thing that they do is fly to their mothers. And uh, so they'll, you know, their their wings and they'll be flying straight to find them all. But she says that there's a, a little sad part of that. Because some of those kids, when they rise, will not be able to find their parents. And the point from that is, parents, let that not be our kids. Let's make sure that we're there to greet our kids when they arrive. And we know that how that works, right? This is not something that we can do to make it happen. It's something that Jesus does for us, and we have to accept it. And they live in faith, trusting him, and allow him to save us. But she describes there on the sea of glass that Jesus calls all these little kids who have no parents to him. He brings them to him. And the angels come and put their, their crowns on their heads. And he, he, he takes angels and he puts these kids in, in the charge of these angels. Next slide, please. I believe that Jesus is going to be their parent. He's going to make special sure that these orphans, he's, he's the father of the fathers, the defender of the widows, the Bible says. He'll make sure that these kids are taken well care of and are raised by a loving father. It's better if the parents are there, but he's going to make sure that it's, it's good anyway. Let's, let's go to the next slide. And so Jesus turns and he opens those massive pearl gates and we begin to walk through. And it's amazing. We're walking in and we see into the city and we're looking down the river of life. Next slide. We begin to walk down this slide, down this slide, down this, the streets. I'm looking at the slide, the computer slide. Is myself. We're walking down the streets of gold with the river of life flowing in between. As we walk, we can look, we can just see this, this beautiful, shining thing at the end. Of course, this is the throne of God. We're headed that, that direction. As we walk, next slide. 
We come across the tree of life, which this, again, all these pictures are poor representations of the reality, but we do what we can. And we, we, we find the tree of life, which, which its trunks grow on both sides of the river. In fact, according to the spirit of prophecy, she says that at first you couldn't even tell that there was one tree here, it was like one tree, but it was like two trees, and you had to look way up to see where the trunks meet together and form one tree. The Bible says that the leaves of that tree will be the healing of the nations. We'll be able to eat the fruit that's on that tree. That, that fruit, uh, as, as he describes it, like, like a gold color, it's silver, and, and there's a different one, each one's a different kind of fruit, which that's kind of unusual. Most trees grow one kind of fruit, but it grows a different kind. So then, next slide, Jesus welcomes us to the throne of God. And it's like he's introducing us, Father, your people, people, your Father. And next slide. The Bible describes to us what God looks like. This is amazing to me. Yeah, we, it doesn't describe his form, but actually, uh, again, this is not up here, but um, the spirit of prophecy, she makes it very clear that he, he has the shape of a human. Which makes sense. You, you can get that in the Bible. We were made in God's image. Not just spiritually, but physically. So, imagine this being sitting in a throne, shining light. You can't even imagine. So, so bright that the angels have to cover their eyes. And we know that angels are so bright that we would have to cover our eyes if we see them. So just imagine how bright he is. And the Bible describes, and it uses the same word, it uses jasper to describe it. We, we already know what jasper looks like, right? There's another picture of what fire bubble looks like, a different, different piece. This, this is what one of the colors of God, not a person that's multicolored, but this is one of the, 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 the stones that John uses to describe how God looks. And then another stone, the next one, an appearance of jasper and sardines. Which is a red stone. So he's, he's kind of got white and red, all these different colors mixed together. God is a beautiful, colorful God, the shape of a human. And we're going to be just transfixed. Wow. But it's not what he looks like that's really so important, right? It's the heart that's, that's inside that being that beats. I'm not sure if it beats. He makes the hearts that beats. But when, however it works, his heart beats with love for us. And he sings a song over us. And then he says, come on, let's go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's go to the next slide. We said this, this table where you, you can't see, you, you can see the end of it, but it stretches for miles and miles and miles, and so now your eyes are like eagle eyes. And you're sitting at this table, and Jesus himself comes to serve us. I can imagine Jesus coming around and putting his hand on my shoulder and saying, I brought your paper. How do you know how much water this thing? <laughs> Boy, they don't have cheese and have rice. Maybe they do. Who knows? They have cows. Okay. Really healthy cheese. <laughs> and if it's not, we'll have vegan cheese and it will taste just like a real thing. Okay. Which we haven't accomplished on this area. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> and uh, so, there's the. Next slide, please. And so now our tummies are full, but we're not too full, right? We don't overeat in heaven. We feel just right. But we 